Dámy a pánové, za malou chvilku začínáme. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to open up this very special event. My name is Josef Schima, I'm president of Cevro Institute, the place um, we are here. And this is our rather new product, Cevro Institute Business Forum Series, which is a series of public talks and debates with leading figures of world business community. We started a couple of months ago with Jan Milfeit, Vice President of Microsoft Corporation, and this is our second step. Today, I am extremely honored to have another very special speaker, Lars Christensen, founder and CEO of Saxo Bank. Originally, I wanted to name his talk how did, I made, how did I make my first billion to attract large audience? Uh, indeed, who wouldn't want to learn from his success? But then I was having second thoughts. Severo Institute is not, after all, a business school. Our aim is much more than give a recipe for and celebrate a single success story. Severo Institute is a school of legal and social studies, and we are proudly very explicit about crucial values every decent society must be built upon. And our goal is to enhance understanding of those values, critically evaluate them, and make themselves, make sure our students know them by heart, and know how these values manifest themselves in the study of political science, economics, law, sociology, and political philosophy. Cevro Institute is a school that builds on a long tradition of classical liberal and conservative thinking, appreciates market-based society, and believes in entrepreneurially driven social progress. There is plenty of big businesses around, but too often, unfortunately, they form close and intimate links with those in politics, and rather than making money by satisfying their customers, they engage in rent-seeking and live off special deals and political privileges. They are, however, and fortunately, others. True believers in private property, order, or capitalism, for short. Successful people who believe in it, who practice it, and who are, moreover, willing to speak up for its defense. In defense of capitalism, how our freedom and future is threatened by the expansion of government. That is our topic for today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving you Lars Christensen, CEO of Saxo Bank. Lars, I'm very happy you are here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Josef. Thank you to you for coming, and, and thank you to uh, several Institute for inviting me here. I've actually been here for almost uh, 72 hours because we had a, a great event over the weekend uh, where, where we, we gathered some, some young entrepreneurs for something called IPO48 uh, and, and young people got together in teams and tried to build a full business, uh, viable business idea in, in 48 hours uh, and that was, uh, I had the pleasure of being the jury member there to say what is the best of these 20 ideas. They were not all equally good, but, but it was still 
quite impressive what came out of 48 hours of, of good capitalistic thinking. So uh, basically, this feels like home now after, after Friday and Saturday and Sunday here. Uh, so I'm happy to also uh, get this chance to speak to you. I'm also happy, of course, for the subject because it's two things that are close to my heart, Saxo Bank and capitalism. In fact, I like to think of them as one subject because it was always my, my hope to make an organization that was truly capitalistic and free market in nature. That's pretty tough in the banking world today to, to stick to those ideals because uh, banking uh, has had a rough ride for, for a few years. But, uh, but we're still trying to, to live some traditional market values, capitalistic values, uh, recognize uh, good performance, remunerate people according to, to results, uh, being rational uh, capitalists. Uh, but unfortunately today that represents ideas that are, that are not very popular by, by our rulers. Uh, these ideas, capitalist ideas that have created progress for centuries, ideas that in my view have created all of the wealth that we, we have in the world today, ideas that created the entire basis for the welfare state, uh, and ideas that, that the very people that benefit the most from them, the non-producers, the redistributors, the politicians, the thieves, uh, ideas that they really hate uh, but that they live from, uh, and maybe they hate the ideas because they know if the ideas were, were truly running the world then probably they wouldn't succeed the way they can do today. But I'll get back to politicians later on. I hope there's not too many in the audience because uh, it's going to be a little tough on politicians. They've been tough on bankers for a few years, so uh, it's time for payback. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Saxo Bank. You may not know it. We actually have an office here in Prague. It's an investment bank uh, that I started together with uh, uh, my colleague Kim Fonet, who is still co-CEO together with me, uh, about uh, 19 years ago. We started it up as an entrepreneurial business. Uh, we had $80,000 between us uh, and, and two employees when we, when we started the business. And I say most of, of, of what has happened since has been true, uh, true natural growth. Um, I didn't actually join the bank until about three years after we founded it because I had a good job in London. Uh, I, I obviously helped try to facilitate trading for the bank uh, that was uh, very small, it was a brokerage at that time, uh, and help them find the counterparts, but, but I didn't actually join until three years into the, into the, 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 the history of the, the bank. So I, I came back to Denmark where the bank is, has, is headquartered from London in, in 1995, uh, and that was around the same time as we, we identified the internet as a possibility. When we started the, the bank, uh, I would like to say that we had a big vision and we would, knew that we would become an online brokerage and all this, but we didn't. We, like many businesses, we, we tried to get our foot on our own table. We tried to, to uh, give people a good service, but we didn't, to be honest, have a great vision of where we were going. And as none of us were or even are particularly technology savvy, uh, we didn't really realize there was anything called the Internet when we started it up. Subsequently, we found out, thankfully, and that has, uh, has been very important for us ever since. We hired uh, a handful of programmers to, we thought, you know, maybe we could do this trading on the internet, maybe that could differentiate us a little bit as a very small organization. So we hired a handful of programmers and thought, you know, we'll give them six months to develop a, a program, then we can get on with life and, and, and be on the internet, and we don't need, uh, need to spend more time on this IT stuff doesn't work that way with IT, as you will know if you've been involved with it. Uh, IT people tend to, to reproduce themselves very quickly, so all of a sudden there's many more than you thought you, you were originally going to employ, and today we have more than 600 people actually uh, continuously developing the platform. It's about uh, probably about 40% of our staff that, that actually are involved in IT uh, in one, some way, shape, or form. Our first trading program we, uh, we brought out in 98, uh, which were very early days for, for, for an exchange trading program as it was. There were some stock trading programs around, but, but we were one of the very first uh, that offered foreign exchange trading on, on the internet. 
and uh, it was actually not very successful. Uh, we maybe were a little bit too early with the idea. It took a while before we, we started to see some customer pick up, but thankfully we had a, uh, a good sort of traditional business that we, that we could live from in the meantime while, while this uh, vision came to pass. Uh, today, uh, 13 years uh, later, uh, we, we're actually the biggest retail uh, foreign exchange investor uh, platform in the world. Uh, I don't know exactly how they arrive at these numbers, but they say we have approximately 14% of the world market share for private investors trading uh, in, in currencies. Uh, we have uh, more than more than a thousand direct employees and, and, and several hundred uh, uh, outsourcing people that are working for us 100%. And we have uh, inside these, uh, uh, this employer group, we have, we have about 70 different nationalities, uh, seven zero nationalities. It's always been part of our philosophy that we wanted to go very international, very global. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons you, you find us here, but we also have offices in 18 other countries around the world. And we also always believe very much in, even if you have a good, uh, let's say, international product, it's very important to meet people on their own uh, conditions, speaking their language, obviously, but also understanding their service requirements, their expectations, etc. So that has led us, that has led us to a very specific strategy of, of, of uh, having a very multinational uh, uh, employee group. The platform itself is, is currently in 22 different languages, uh, anything from, from major uh, European languages to, to Chinese, uh, uh, Indonesian, and, and, and a lot of uh, quite exotic languages as well. Uh, we have a lot of focus on frontier countries, uh, new emerging countries. We, we Obviously, we think we can expand market share in, in Western Europe uh, uh, over time, but we also really want to focus on being in areas where there's growth, where there's uh, new people moving into, into upper middle class, uh, having a requirement for our type of products. Uh, so so uh, we are today uh, in quite a lot of places around the world and still looking to add a number of uh, of uh, emerging countries to, to our office, uh, uh, group of offices. Today we do much more than foreign exchange. We do futures, we do stocks, we do asset management, we, we do different derivatives, etc. So it's actually quite a, a broad multi-asset platform, uh, but still I would say about 70% of our revenues derived from trading foreign exchange uh, in, in, in different ways. Somewhere along the line, we realized that, that this product also had relevance for other institutions. So a very important part of our business today is to take our own platform, white label it to other uh, banks and, and financial institutions so that they can use our technology, but in their own identity. So we run the whole infrastructure, but as a client of another institution, you will see that brand promoted and, and, and it will be their people you interact with. Uh, some of them are well-known names like Citigroup uses our platform. We just made a deal with Barclays that just launched our platform. And some of them are less known, smaller uh, banks and brokers around the world. But all in all, it's, it's very important for us, this extra distribution force of all these participating institutions. We um, handle a couple of hundred thousand trades a day. Uh, our average client trades twice a day, which for those of you that know, about online trading, that's a very high number because it's a type of product where people trade very actively. Uh, and I think our peak day, we, we hit just close to 700,000 trades. So the system is, is quite scalable and, and can handle quite a big, uh, quite a big turnover. As I mentioned, uh, just to look at the, the structure of the company, uh, I founded it together with, with Kim. Uh, and, and today we still share the CEO role. That's pretty unorthodox from a normal traditional business point of view, but it works probably because we, we've been all the, the way together all, all along. We always made sure that we had what we call communism at the first class, you know, uh, where we, we have the same size office, the same size car, the same salary, the same this and that. Uh, so everything that's good for Kim is good for me, and everything that's, that's good for me is good for Kim. So, so this kind of uh, uh, communism on first class has, has worked quite well for us. Uh, uh, and we still, after 19 years, run it together. Uh, 
We have, though, been through a transition phase the last couple of years, brought in additional management because we're clearly hitting the usual entrepreneur issue where, you know, we started with two people, all of a sudden you got more than a thousand, it's a different job. And, and uh, in a rare moment of, of self-recognition, we, we thought maybe, maybe, just maybe we should get some professional guys in to help us out here, yeah? So we brought in a lot of management over the past years and, and uh, are probably less hands-on than we used to be, but, but we have some really smart people looking after the business, which is why I can afford the luxury and stand here and speak to nice people like yourself instead of, of being in my office. Uh, the bank came from a very small point of departure. As I said, uh, $80,000 we invested in it originally. But we have been fortunate to have very high growth over the years, and, and last year we made about a $120 million post-tax uh, profit. Uh, and while we are an unlisted company, privately owned company, uh, the, the stocks trade very seldomly, but, but, uh, but when they do, it's with a market cap in the 1.6 to 2 billion US dollar uh, market uh, range. So uh, it's been a growth story. It's been uh, interesting. We were lucky to, to be the right place at the right time with the internet before anybody was really interested in it, so we could, we could still gain a foothold before big banks got involved. When years later they began to be interested, it was too late for them, so now they rather partner up with us than, than perhaps develop their own programs for, for this type of niche activity. So I think you have to recognize uh, that, uh, that uh, timing and, and, and focus, which, which you really are not completely the master of yourself uh, has been fortunate for us and has given us a good opportunity to grow over the years. Uh, so, and I think we still have a lot of growth uh, possibilities ahead of us. Uh, the market is huge uh, for, for financial services as a whole, obviously. We believe that the way that we do financial services with technology, online-based, competitive, people can get self-empowered around their own strategies. We believe that's the future of financial services, at least for a very large part, or as, as younger people grow up, we're much more uh, used to using, using technology for, for doing different things. Uh, so, so we still think there's a lot of room for, for growing and expanding the business uh, in coming years. And that's in spite of, of all the challenges that, that we face. Uh, there's more regulation day by day, uh, more political abuse against bankers, uh, more taxes, uh, special taxes, this and the other. But in spite of all this, we're actually quite optimistic about the, the possibilities for the future. But uh, I think we all have to recognize, and here I'm turning a little bit away from Saxo Bank itself, that the world is currently at risk. Uh, the financial crisis here have, have triggered some new discussions about how should you organize society, how should you organize the economy. Discussions and ideas that really you thought were dead because they have proven themselves wrong so many times in the past, but now they, they seem to revive again. Uh, and, and you see a lot of populism, populistic ideas, uh, even sort of, in my view, slightly fascist ideas about how to, to run an economy in, in, in between the government, as you touched upon, between government and business in an unhealthy uh, collaboration there. there. There's a lot of, of, of rats coming out of the sewers at the moment, right? So, uh, so we have to be very careful about, uh, about what, what comes from here. The financial crisis came a little bit as a black swan, you know, the, the idea of the black swan, the unexpected event before before we found Australia, people had never seen a black swan, so they thought all swans were white, and when they got to Australia, they said, hey, here's a paradigm change, a swan can be black. Uh, so you use this kind of terminology, as you probably know, for, for an unexpected event, and I think the, the financial crisis, to some extent, even though retrospectively it looks quite predictable, was a bit of a black swan. Uh, coming out of the blue for most people, and uh, and uh, shocking people, I think, to, to a point where there's a, there's a whole new stream of, of, of irrationality and populism and socialism that is, that is pushing forward and threatening to, to, uh, to overcome us all. So I think there is a need. I think, in fact, there's a desperate need for a defense for, for capitalism, as uh, the second subject of this talk is. And there's really a desperate need for providing the, de the necessary knowledge and information about how does this world work because it works in some very 
predictable ways, and if you do certain things, you will get certain outcomes. There's a desperate need, in my view, to remind people around us that uh, capitalism is the hero. It's not the villain of, of what we expect, uh, what we have experienced the past few years. Capitalism is the savior, not the destroyer of wealth and, and welfare and security. Individuals are the ones that create valuable things in life, while politicians destroy them. It's not the other way around. It shouldn't be necessary to defend capitalism. It should be enough to explain it. The historic evidence of superiority of capitalism is so self-evident, so overwhelming, so much not in need of defense that, that it's nearly un unbelievable that it's under threat again the way it is. But it is under threat, uh, and, and many of these ideas are, are, are coming up again, ideas that derive from modern versions of ideologies that, that have impoverished and even killed hundreds of millions of people in, in the not-so-distant history. This threat clearly cannot come from rationality. It comes from something else, something deeper, something more sinister, and I'll revert to that a little bit later. But if you look at the current state of things first, I don't know if, if you do it here in, in, in the Czech Republic, but as a child, we had a game called Opposite Will, where everything was uh, the opposite. You know, you were the teacher and the teacher was a kid and, and everything was turned on his head. It's quite a funny game when you're a kid, but I don't think it's so nice when you're grown up. And I think we're a little bit part of a grown up version of Opposite Will today. Because we hear politicians talking about how they create jobs and, and, and how they saved us all. Well, politicians don't create jobs. I mean, at least not without killing many, many jobs uh, in other places where people don't see the connection. We have politicians talking about how they're investing to, to contain the crisis. But that's not true. I mean, they prolong the crisis by doing uh, exactly what created it, borrowing more and more money until the point where, where it can no longer be repaid. In Europe, we've heard for years about how the Eurozone Corporation has helped weak economies become more responsible and how it has helped secure political stability. But it's opposite, Will. The reality is that the Eurozone is destroying prosperity in many of the countries, particularly Mediterranean at the moment, by removing the last options that they had to, to uh, survive with their inefficiencies. Greece was the first country to really pay the price, but uh, Ireland uh, and the next victims will fall like dominoes in the coming years. And I'm worried on the political stability aspect that this will create social unrest that we haven't seen in Europe for decades. Uh, we're already beginning to see it, uh, but it could get a lot worse. We see more and more good businesses being penalized and forced to support and bail out bad business. Climate hysteria has been used as justification for a long time for very rational and corrupt investments in businesses that had no chance of surviving in the real world without the hordes of lobbyists helping to extract money from governments and, and supranational agencies. United Nations that have failed so miserably in its duties, again, opposite will, is now trying to become a kind of a world government. We take questions after, if that's okay. Um, uh, with the right to tax and impoverish the wealthy nations to benefit corrupt regimes that have tirelessly destroyed the freedom and welfare of their own nations. We hear that lack of regulation uh, caused the financial crisis. In fact, it was the opposite. The financial sector is already regulated to a level where it's impossible for both bankers and regulators to keep track of the regulation. Because of all the regulations and the immensely complicated accounting rules, no one can any longer read a balance sheet or find out what obligations a financial institution actually has. And because of the implicit bailout of, of almost any financial institution, any debtor, any insurer, and a multitude of, of, of uh, investor protection schemes around the world, nobody cares about it because there's no consequence for a depositor or a banker if he's careless. It was, again, politicians that created these monstrous volumes of laws and regulations to protect us against the free market, and, and uh, the consequences have been predictable, because just exactly because the free market was no longer allowed to protect us against idiotic and opaque business models, these models have thrived to a point where, where healthy, responsible businesses will pay when things go wrong, while the institutions that made the mistakes will be supported and bailed out by by taxpayers' money. So the answer is not more laws or more rules or more regulation. It's less but better rules and regulation. 
And the answer is not to save these capitalists, so-called capitalists, from the consequences of the markets. The, the answer is to expose them to the market, to the cold, clear truth and the consequences of free markets so that stupid ideas uh, fail. But I think it's important to understand that uh, a lot of things are the opposite as what we're being told today. So welcome to, to opposite will for, for grown-ups. It's not a game that I like very much. So this destruction of free markets by intervention, intervention and more intervention has accelerated massively during the crisis of the past couple of years. And if you don't already have a problem, you can safely rely on the government being there to create one for you. It reminds you very much of Ronald Reagan's famous uh, nine most dangerous words in the world. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. If somebody says that, you should be really worried. And I'm sure uh, in the audience you can think of other examples uh, 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 to the same effect. However, it's not just about politicians, right? If you look at it, uh, there was a volcano, uh, uh, if you remember, that, that grounded airlines for a week or so, not so long ago. Uh, and that means that every airline in the world was clamoring to get government help. I mean, imagine running a business for decades and you get grounded for a week and, and, and you can't handle that. EU farmers, they can't exist without uh, handouts. Green companies, they claim that their higher moral standing of their products entitles them to have not to make their own living. Financial engineers in our own sector take on risks that make big institutions with 100 years of history shake in their foundation and, and, and have to rely on politicians to survive. So business people are very much to blame, as you also touched upon, as well as politicians. While Politicians are obviously happy to tax and redistribute the revenues. Far too many capitalists, in my view, are happy to receive these handouts. So unfortunately, it's no longer, and hasn't been for a long time, very easy to see where capitalism ends and where socialism starts. It's not a battle between business and government, but it's an unhealthy and increasingly corrupt symbiosis between the two. And who's paying for it? The average guy in the street that, that gets up in the morning, goes to work, does his job. He's the real victim of this corruption as a taxpayer, as an overpaying consumer, and a voter with nothing worth voting for. So the changes we have to work for, the defense that we have to, to mount to save rationality, to save freedom, to save our ability to continuously grow the wealth and security of us all, starts there. It starts with the average guy trying to support and protect his family from an increasingly corrupted and irrational society. He's the guy that would truly benefit from capitalism, from efficiency, from competition, from choice, from freedom. And he's the one we need to have on our side, not the politicians or the collaborating business people. They live, both of them, from sucking this guy dry through taxes and, and privileges that they hand out to each other. So when we need to, about the talk to defend capitalism, we need to be very precise and very careful about what we're defending. In the same way, I tell my colleagues in the bank to, to control their knee-jerk reaction to defend our industry across the board. Many, many people in the financial industry do not deserve to be defended for what happened because they construed ridiculous products and they sold them in, in deceitful ways. They were definitely helped by, by the state destroying normal market dynamics that would have exposed them much earlier had they been allowed to work freely. But that doesn't excuse the, the blatant abuse of, of government protection and the willingness to take taxpayers' money to bail them out. Businesses that exploit government favors or willingly rely on other people's money forcefully taken from them in taxes, in my view, cannot be considered more people. They're not defenders of capitalism just because they pay themselves big salaries if they have not earned those salaries in an honest and rational way. So we have to be very, very careful about who we defend, when we defend capitalism. And it's unfortunately very easy to make a mistake these days. But it's not difficult, though, to identify enemies of capitalism and rationality. Many world leaders today, in my view, are, 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 are enemies of freedom and capitalism. Even people that were elected on a different agenda and different history. I think the performance of leaders of France and Germany is tremendously disappointing. That the new U.S. president was never going to be a friend of capitalism is not a surprise. He pretty much said that very openly. But, uh, but it's very worrying that so many leading politicians uh, have become so populistic, so interventionist, uh, uh, and turned into 
reckless spenders of, of public money. That, that is really truly disturbing when you think about the damage that they cause to the basic dynamics of, uh, of our capitalistic wealth creation. And unfortunately supported a large part of the way by applauding voters that are happy to see the rich bleed. They're happy to see smart business people being portrayed as vile and selfish and opponents of the public good. There's something very destructive in these dynamics that we have managed to create in the world. And what is that, that sinister force that, that leads our society to, to seek this self-destruction? I think it's a totalitarian aspect of democracy. If you can secure 51% of the vote, in essence, you can rule the remaining 49% with a heavy-handedness that would impress many dictators. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that many uh, dictators actually used democracy to, to extinguish it as soon as they got the chance. And the problem is that a well-functioning democracy consists of two important ideological components that balance each other out. One is a basic acceptance that as a lesser of evils, when we have to make an important decision, for the overall welfare and security of a nation, the majority wins the day. Hard to think of a better way to make big decisions. But equally important, inside a community with that common understanding, there also exists some fundamental negative rights, as we call them, rights that the majority must respect, things that they simply cannot do, even if they are, uh, are a majority set out quite appropriately in, for example, the U.S. Constitution. You may not take my property. You may not use violence against me. You may not prevent me from the pursuit of my own happiness. And we've simply forgotten about the second half of the equation, those negative rights protecting each of the individuals from excesses of the majority. And I think we need to, to really speak up to change this, this modern corruption of democracy. We need to make everybody understand that there's a limit to what democracy can force its minority to do. And I believe that still, even in this progressed state, uh, most people actually agree that there is a limit to, to what a majority can do. But we need to define that limit much more clearly than it is today. And right now, the tolerance for where that limit is just goes up and up and up and up. So I think that the world is in for, for a pretty rough ride. Unless things change soon, we could potentially hit a downturn that will make recent troubles appear a little bit like a nice walk in the park. And I think that individual freedom and democracy will be severely threatened in, in, uh, in the coming years. As the money runs out around the world, which is already happening in, in Western Europe, certainly, and the truly productive businesses get taxed into the ground, uh, it'll be interesting to see how civilized we actually have become over the past couple of hundred years. I, I think we could be in for some very nasty surprises uh, and uh, some very serious uh, uh, cases of social unrest, even in countries where we suspected that that was a thing of the past. So the defense of capitalism is very, very important. It is vital to the survival of, of growth, prosperity, and freedom. So uh, the risk of a healthy society collapsing into a socialistic uh, hellhole, I don't think has ever been described more convincingly or more vividly than in Atlas Rock, the famous novel by Ayn Rand. Somebody might uh, know it here. Uh, this is actually a book that we distributed widely in, in Denmark. We distributed over 10,000 copies over the years. And uh, I think that that, uh, that book, Atlas Rock, is something I can highly recommend and describes very well the situation that we're in at the moment. And I just want to quote one uh, uh, commentator that, that uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal recently, uh, uh, Mr. Stephen Moore from Wall Street Journal recently wrote, the current economic strategy is right out of Atlas Rock. The more incompetent you are, the more handouts the politician will bestow on you. As Atlas grimly foretold, we now treat the incompetent who wreck their companies as victims, while the resourceful business owners who manage to make a profit are portrayed as recipients of illegitimate windfalls. Uh, and I think that that's a very accurate description both of what's going on now and a good uh, conceptual description of what's happening in Atlas Rock. So, so I think that book is, is pretty interesting. The argument I Mrs. Rand uh, tells us for capitalism is a moral one. It's not a utilitarian one that just because it works, because it does, it's clear that capitalism works better than socialism or communism. I think in this country you probably know that better than most. 
but, uh, but that's not the only reason to, to support it. That's a utilitarian argument. Uh, there's a moral argument uh, as well. Uh, that capitalism is morally right because of the individual's uh, intellectual capacity and ability to create and produce and, and obviously having the ownership rights to, to this personal creation uh, and, and product that, that are created by each uh, individual in society. Capitalism also creates uh, a lot of prosperity for people around creative individuals, but that's a side benefit. That's not the goal in itself. So we need to remember also the moral superiority of capitalism today more than ever. We need to remember that the, the corruption comes from, from collective interference in our, our society. And we need to really try to stay away from these corruptive forces as uh, much as it's in our power, uh, because otherwise the consequences will be, will be quite severe in my view. I'm very concerned about the morality of many business people. And in reality, true capitalism today, I guess, exists mainly in intellectual circles, but, but rarely in, in real life. So we need to secure a broader understanding of, of among normal people of how beneficial capitalism actually is to them. We need to understand better uh, our own responsibility for, for not cutting corners and supporting a, an evil socialistic system with our sanction and our contribution of intellect and productive capacity. Changes, in my view, are created uh, over the long term by ideas. And therefore, it's very important to, to have institutions like this one. It's important to have like-minded people to, to share ideas and inspiration. Uh, it's important to have think tanks where, where we can create and provide bullets and firepower intellectually for, for each other to go out and, and, and wage a war on, on, on these destructive ideas that, uh, that are spreading quite rapidly. Personally, I feel that it, it might be uh, a losing battle, uh, certainly in Western Europe and the US, at least in the short term. Uh, I think some countries, unfortunately my own is one of them, we may already be past the point of no return. More voters in Denmark today live off government subsidies than, than actually participate in private business activities. And it's hard to see why they would vote any other way than try to, to improve their situation uh, given that they have a majority. Politicians unfortunately also know that the way to power goes through appealing to that majority desiring government support rather than appealing to the minority that, that is securing the financial foundation. If you look, uh, forgive me for mentioning my own country, but that's the one I know the best, but the Danish tax pressure has gone from actually being very liberalistic uh, in 1950 where we had only 20% of GDP tax pressure to being around 50% tax pressure in just, in, just, uh, in just 60 years. And in, in 2009, I haven't seen the 2010 figures yet, but in 2009, our government that is actually seen as relatively financially responsible by EU standards spent 59% of GDP. I mean, it's just a scary development. So it's not good. In fact, I think it begins to look a little bit like a lost cause, but, uh, but that's not a very nice thing to face up and realize. Uh, I think there's still a lot of hope for the world, but, but maybe not a lot of it left in, in certain social welfare countries of Western Europe like, like my own. The question is really whether a more rational and intuitive understanding can be created among the people of the country that uh, eventually will allow them to, to make the change so that they will start rewarding the politicians for doing the right thing rather than rewarding them for doing the wrong thing. I don't believe that you can convince politicians to do the right thing. Politicians will only ever do what gives them the most votes. Uh, and have, therefore, really, the work has to be at a more ground level, trying to convince the population of common sense, uh, of rationality, and, and, and to try to help them understand the real predicament they're facing in the long run. Only when there's a majority of the population wanting that, you're going to get politicians that deliver it. So, uh, I think some of that understanding may be achieved through experience since the beginning of a breakdown in the system, and I think we're seeing that at the moment. We're seeing that if you project uh, demographics, if you look at, at current expenditure, you can see that, that, uh, that this system is beginning to break down. It's not a nice thing to face up to, but, but I think it's, it's a necessary precondition to, to have some crisis uh, awareness to, to deliver change. Uh, I think the financial crisis 
has delivered part of that first component, the, the personal experience of, of, of things not, not really uh, working uh, in the way we expected them to work. And people like, like us uh, in, in this room uh, need to deliver the second component, which is education information, showing people that it doesn't have to be that way. And they can thank their own politicians, the people they elected for, for most of their predicament. So uh, I think that's, that's a very, very important uh, uh, struggle, certainly in, in, in some of the more challenged countries in, in Western Europe. It's an uphill struggle to take on that role because the message is not very popular. It's not very welcome. People don't really want to hear it. Uh, they want to hear a story of everything will be okay and, and uh, we, we will all be fine in the long run. But it's sadly not the way it is. The real story is that, that each individual has to increasingly begin to take on personal responsibility. And, and that's unfortunately something that many have become used to avoid and to test. Uh, but I think still there's a lot of people around the world that, uh, that are trying to fight this uh, battle and, and I hope that some of you here in this room are, are part of that uh, because it is an important course, the defense of capitalism. Uh, some people have to do it and uh, maybe we're some of them. In Atlas Rock, the prime movers eventually give up and their fight to turn the society around and they leave and they create a new society in a secret valley that's called Gold Gulch, a, a free world only for capitalists. Uh, this, of course, is, is a nice fiction, but I think we have to, to work very hard to, to try to secure that our own countries become kind of golf, uh, of Gold Gulches, kind of these valleys where we do the right thing in our country. I think you can actually quite uh, easier than before because so many people are irrational, uh, so many countries are irrational, it's easier to provide uh, something that will attract business in a relatively free-moving world that will attract taxpayers by not overtaxing them, attract business by not over-regulating them and benefit from that. I fought and I continue to fight that battle in my home country in Denmark but, but uh, through supporting different liberalistic causes but uh, but I must say that, that I, I recently took the consequence of, of my own lack of trust in, in the direction that, that my country is taking. So, so I, uh, I opt myself and, and moved to Switzerland, which I think is uh, one of the few examples in Europe of somebody actually trying to behave in a rational way. It's not gold skulls, but it's, uh, it's a lot smarter than, than what most other countries are doing. And I think countries like Denmark, like Switzerland, like, like, like the Czech Republic for that matter, have a manageable size, which means you can actually you can actually make these changes if, if, you, if you work for them and, and your populations will benefit greatly from it uh, uh, relatively quickly, I think, particularly because an oasis in the middle of a desert will, will, will normally attract quite a lot of attention. But it's not gold skulls uh, quite yet anywhere, so if anybody should find it somewhere, please let me know. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, let's, uh, let's try to defend capitalism because without capitalism, it would look a, a great deal uglier than it does now. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be challenged. Thank you. I don't think EU has a great history of delivering very efficient uh, initiatives. Uh, and I think the very clear thing, this was identified even 150 years ago by, you can tell me that, I can't, uh, Bastia, uh, what you see and what you don't see, right? Uh, the problem is that if you spend money to create a job here, that may well create a job. The only problem is that the money you spent, you have to take from somewhere. And in that process, you probably lose two jobs somewhere else, right? And that's a real predicament of all these packages, right? 
either they are borrowed from, from the market, which means it's later on there's going to be taxation which destroys jobs, or they are created by taxation which, which in itself destroys jobs. If it costs a million, corona or whatever, to, to create a job here, well, you have to get that from somewhere, and probably that destroys minimum a job at the other place where you create it. So it's kind of shifting these things around with a lot of bureaucracy in the middle. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that no politician have ever created jobs to note uh, when you add up all the consequences, right? Of course you create jobs in the green sector when you, when you support uh, initiatives that will otherwise break down, because otherwise the companies would go bankrupt. But that money comes from healthy businesses that, that then cannot invest and cannot grow more, more solidly founded jobs to, for, for, the, for, for their businesses, right? So nothing comes of nothing. The only way you can create something of nothing is in the short term to borrow money. But again, if you look just a little bit longer than, than, than one year, two years ahead, clearly you're not only going to have to repay the money, you're also going to have to pay interest so the damage is even greater. So. Uh, it's, just a, uh, uh, it's just a fata morgana, this idea that you create jobs by, by spending money on them. You, you kill off more jobs than you create here. But, but of course, for a business that is a recipient of those uh, funds so that he can profit from it, he would love it and hence will lobby very strongly for it. The guys that pay for it uh, will, will often be more dispersed so they don't have a strong lobby organization which, uh, because it might be old businesses that, that have slightly worse conditions to, to improve conditions significantly here. And hence, the, the, the beneficiary will have much more interest in, in getting this benefit than the person paying for it may, may see uh, only a small fraction of that payment, but it adds up to the same job losses or more, right? So, to be honest, I, I don't believe very much in, in initiatives other than initiatives that reduce the restrictions on, on uh, I mean, the single market per se is an excellent idea. I mean, uh, the fact that you removed trade restrictions between the countries in, in Europe was extremely important for growth. So I'm not saying everything that was done historically was bad or, or wrong, because, but, uh, but, but, but that's where it should have stopped. I mean, you, you should have stopped at trying to create a a, a, a well-functioning inner market and open it up as much as possible to other regions in the world. You shouldn't have had all these enormously complex uh, constructions on top trying to regulate everything under the sun. So net-net, I think a lot of the benefit from, from, from having created uh, tr international trade with less friction is, is to a large extent being offset by, by all the, the, the strange supranational uh, constructions that, that on the other hand are, are very negative for growth. Good. I found out that the European Commission made it possible to receive feedback from the EU citizens concerning this initiative by the end of February. Uh, I found out, according to the EU and statistics, that uh, the most of the financial TNCs, or top 50 uh, TNCs, are based in the EU member states. In case those TNCs representatives uh, send their feedback to the European Commission, would you suppose that the EU bureaucracy would consider those comments or just throw that into waste bin? <laughs> I don't uh, uh, claim to know what, what they do with suggestions, but, but it doesn't seem like a lot of good ones are getting through, let me put it that way. Right? You do have the feeling with a lot of things that you get asked and you have to be asked and a lot of reporting that you do today that, that very few people, if any, subsequently read it, but, uh, but that... Uh, uh, I would I would scare your skepticism that it would make a great deal of difference. Let, let me let me put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jan Havel of Severo Institute. Uh, I share your vision on um, on the disaster that we are coming uh, coming towards and. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you can elaborate a little bit on the disaster that we are heading to in money and banking, and not speaking about bankruptcies, but rather impacts on the entire scheme of paper money and fractional reserves. And on a related note, uh, do we have a free banking department at Saxo Bank? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't A free sorry. banking department. A, a free banking department, well, what is that? Well, a group of guys that would you know, prepare Saxo Bank for the disaster in banking. 
for, for the disappearance of paper money. And uh, I can tell you I have some pretty, uh, pretty ideological guys in, in my, in my uh, uh, group of economists, but I have to sometimes try to focus them a little bit on what do our investors actually want to know. But I have people that are strong believers in gold footing, etc., and are quite knowledgeable about uh, the, 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 the traps of, of reserve uh, banking, etc. But long and short is, you know, we, we also uh, we have something that our clients want. We, you know, I, I will travel around, and if people ask me, as in this case, I will give my views on, 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 on what's happening in the world. But at the end of the day, my primary objective as a commercial organization is, of course, to, to meet the interest of my clients and to answer the questions and facilitate what they want to invest in. Do I share your concern in the long run about, about the, 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 the future of, uh, of the whole way that the system is structured now, uh, the, the sustainability of it? Do I, am I worried about the effects of quantitative easing and, and how that's going to continue to, to get more and more aggressive? Absolutely. Do I have the solution sitting in, uh, in a department in Saxa Bank? Uh, I think we could fix it, but I don't think anybody's going to listen. So, so uh, I, I have to disappoint you there. But, but I have some pretty smart people that uh, that have very strong views on that. But they also have a, a day job where they they need to support their, their their customers, and so they can't talk about the gold standard all the time, at least, right? But, but, but I I, I am extremely concerned about where where things are going. I, I think the overhang of government debt is is completely intolerable. Uh, the, the lack of, of reaction to, to, to reforming social welfare systems, the lack of willingness to reduce expenditure, the, the, the complete uh, ignoring of, of even quite the generous rules uh, from the Stabilization Pact, etc. I think is deeply concerning, and I think this quantitative easing thing is obviously just a different form of taxation, which uh, is a little bit more palatable to, to people because they don't really understand the consequences of it. But what would the long-term consequence be? I think it'd be quite severe uh, if, if, if we don't see a change in direction at some point. Of course, one day we will see a change in direction because it will be absolutely necessary, but, but uh, but the question is, how, how bad does it have to get before you get to that point? And unfortunately, I think it has to get quite a lot worse. So I'm not particularly optimistic. It doesn't mean that a good businessman can't have a successful life even under those circumstances. So I think you've got to look at it at two levels. You've got to look at it at, a, at your personal level, uh, because, uh, and, and, and you can look at it at the macro level, right? The macro level, we probably have to face up to the best we can do, is share a few ideas, bring forward some information. Uh, and, and, and some hypothesis about what's going to happen and try to prove that. At a personal level, there are many ways you can profit from a collapse, right? There are many ways that you can, you can run a business under difficult circumstances, right? So, so I think you have to, to look at it uh, in, in two ways, right? And your primary responsibility is obviously to make sure that your, your own company or your own organization thrives and and, and, uh, and survives and profits in any environment. And, and I think if you're, if you're aware enough of what's happening around you, I think, I think that can be done in most businesses. Yeah. Maybe not a direct answer to your question. But that's the best I could do. Yeah. I hope I have good time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> let me take the, the let me take the
I'll take the other one first, and then I'll put my brain to work in the background on the second question. Yeah. The Eurozone, I congratulate you. You made the right decision. You stayed out. That's the only sensible thing to do. We did the same, thankfully, in my country. That's one of the few sensible things we did, but, but that at least is helpful because it gives you some more room to maneuver. I have always been, been very opposed to the Euro. I think it's a, it's a terrible project. I completely agree with with President Klaus that this was never driven in any way by economic rationale. It was driven by, by a political ambition. Uh, and this unfortunately shows very clearly because of the necessary internal structure, if it should have worked, have not has an economic structure, uh, the, the, the harmonization of, 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 of different conditions in different countries have simply not been put in place. And for a very good reason, if you had asked the voters to support those things, they would have said go to hell. They would never have voted for it, right? In fact, I think in many countries you never got the chance to even vote for the euro. In Germany, uh, it's said that something like 80-20 would actually have voted against it if you had taken it to a vote. So that's another example of democracy being slightly corrupted. Yeah, uh, but uh, I think the euro is a terrible misconstruct. Uh, it's actually held together a little longer than I expected, but I think you can see now that it's clearly beginning to, to, to fall apart at the edges, right? Uh, the problem about the euro is, of course, that you have widely different economies around Europe and you, have, you don't have uh, lo local efficient tools to deal with it, right? An interest rate that's good for Germany could be catastrophic for, for Greece and vice versa. At the same time, when you no longer have the tool of devaluation, uh, and you don't have very efficient development in your productivity, you know, you, you, you end up being very, very uh, uncompetitive, un, uh, like you have seen in, in, in Greece and Italy, for example, today probably being 30 to 40 percent less competitive vis-a-vis -vis the Germans than they were prior to the Euro. So this has been a, a terrible misfortune for the weak countries. I think everybody sort of saying, oh, well, we helped these guys, we, we got them to, to be disciplined, but that's absolute rubbish. If anybody has benefited from the euro, it has been the Germans that, you know, have now got a stronger competitive position. Now they shouldn't have some bills to pay, uh, which, which of course they, they don't really want to do, and I understand them. Why would you want to pay for an overspending Greek government, but, but at the same time, um, if anybody had an advantage from the Eurozone, it would have been countries like Germany and, and, and countries around that part of the Eurozone. So for Greece, I think we're doing them again a huge disfavor. If we take Greece as an example, we could mention other countries, but, but let's take Greece because it's the most dramatic example, right? Right now, we're just, what are we doing? We're, we're telling to, to uh, somebody that has already spent too much money, we'd like to lend you some more money and everything will be okay. Uh, I mean, you would imagine if you did that to a private person or a household, that would never be the solution to that, right? So, so we're, we're doing them a great disfavor. We're just postponing the time of reckoning. It might be a couple of years, if that long, before they have the next problem. That would be even more unsolvable. Alternatively, we'll give get huge civil unrest in, 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 in Greece if they actually went ahead and did the right things in terms of, of their, 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 their public finances, right? What we should be doing is we should, we should say to Greece, you know, we, we, we're sorry, but you, you, maybe you came in a little bit under false conditions and you don't really seem to benefit very much, so we think you should go out again. And then, of course, that would be highly traumatic, but then we should help with that process rather than trying to help them stay. We should help them leave in a controlled way, which I think is doable. In fact, uh, your president uh, was a guest in, in Saxo Bank in Copenhagen uh, not so long ago, about a year ago, and, 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 and he offered kindly that if we needed any help with, uh, with uh, dissolving two currencies, he had good experiences from, from, uh, from when you I uh, had that situation uh, some, some years ago, uh, and, and I don't think it's as difficult as people make it out to be. I think it is obviously it will create more, a lot of problems, but in the long run it will create much, much more problems trying to continuously try to fit square uh, bricks into round holes, which is what we're doing, right? So the Eurozone for me, in its current form, is only a question of time. Is there a possibility that a little core of the euro uh, centered around Germany, Benelux, maybe France, could exist possibly. It, would it be particularly beneficially? I don't think so. It would probably be better off to go back to the franc and the Deutschmark and all that, but, but it could conceivably consist, I think. 
a euro consisting of 16 countries or even 27 countries when in the really wet dreams uh, trying to expand it, it will never work uh, unless you completely change the political system in, in, in Europe to, to, to make it uniform, to make it a true, true uh, centralized union, which I don't think there's any appetite for and I certainly wouldn't like. It can't work, so it's only a question of time with your zone and, and hence I think you did the right thing. I don't think you should even remotely consider going into the euro, particularly not now when we can see it doesn't work. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, a few people thought it might work, but it can't work. And, and it's quite clear now, so I'm very happy my country stayed out. You should be very happy your country stayed out. Uh, in fact, uh, President Klaus made another comment that you have a, quite a good laboratory here to actually assess the long-term uh, situation around the euro because Slovakia uh, went in and, and Czech didn't and, and while of course there's differences in the economy there are also similarities and hence seeing over time which made the right decision will, will be quite an interesting case study for, for everybody else. We have a little bit in Denmark. We have somebody that we are fairly close to in terms of Sweden. Sweden is also outside the euro but with a floating exchange rate. We have actually a fixed rate so, so the Danish krona is stuck to the euro and moves up and down with the euro. We have, of course, the option of, of going out of that, which is better than not to have that option. But Sweden has a completely free-floating krona. And what happened during the crisis, it went up and down. It was much more volatile, but, but, but it helped Sweden at a time when it needed help. And, and now the Swedish krona is extremely strong, the strongest it's been for, since, uh, since the start of the euro. And Sweden has 5% GDP growth, right? It's probably one of the healthiest economies in, in Europe. And I think... That was due to a number of things. They did some good things on the reform side. They lowered taxes. They cut, cut public expenditure. But it also had a lot to do, in my view, with, with having the ability to control their own, their own uh, currency rate. And there's this kind of... I'm just making this very long answer so I can think about the other question here. Uh, there's this kind of perception that, that devaluation is a terrible thing. You know, we have to stop all these guys devaluating all the time, right? And that's rubbish. I mean, all the major currencies are moving up and down all the time, strongly devaluating in periods, strongly appreciating in other periods. And, and, and that's very good. That's the way that the economy finds equilibrium from, from different excesses and, and, and different problems in, in, in the respective countries. So I think we're still a little bit away from somebody being insane enough to say that the dollar and the pound and the Swiss franc and the euro should be linked in one, right? And still you have their moves that are bigger than you saw in pre pre-Eurozone uh, devaluations in, 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 in European countries. So this story about that this is a good thing, that you have, a, have taken away the devaluation possibility, I think is, is not true. It's obviously a very bad thing for Greece, uh, but it's of course nice for, for business again. I think you shouldn't underestimate that a lot of, of, of sort of northern European businesses uh, are quite happy that, that the southern European countries are prevented from devaluing because that means they don't have to be quite as lean and mean as they would otherwise be forced to do. Not the same way as you see in Japan where being under constant pressure from an appreciating yen, you have also created some, some very efficient businesses, right? So I, I just don't think the euro is a good idea and I think it's very wise to stay out of it and I think that will only become more evident in the next few years. As to the other question, as I said, I hope I will have quite a few years to consider the answer to it, so it will not, it will not be the final answer, but uh, I don't know. I think in, in life uh, you have to make the best of, of, of your own situation, right? You have to try to be as good as you reasonably can with what you happen to have, have been, been equipped with from, from nature's side, so that, that gives different people different opportunities. Some people can become American presidents, some people can run a nice business, some people can hold a good job, some people are unfortunate enough to not be able to do any of those things but, but, and, and may justifiably need help, and, and I think most people are willing to do that, but I think for whatever you are yourself, you have to feel that you do pretty much the most you can do, and I think if you can look back and say, well, you know, with whatever I was happened to, to be equipped with, I feel I, I got something out of that, you know, and I think that comes into a few areas. It comes into, comes into family, it comes into business, it comes into some uh, influence on, on the surrounding uh, near society, perhaps, and, and I think that's what you're going to be reviewing at that, uh, that moment in time. Did, did I at least uh, make 
reasonable use of, of the chances I had. And I think if you can answer yes to that question, you, you, you will, you'll be a happy man. And if, you, if it's a resounding no, I had lots of opportunity, but I never made anything of it, I think you, you, will, you will be a little disappointed. So I don't know. I haven't thought too much about specific wording, but I think that's the feelings you're going to be left with. And I don't know where you're going to come out on, on that yet. I think that's... Uh, that's uh, very dependent on, on, on what, I don't know what the option is for Saxo Bank. If Saxo Bank has a chance to be 10 times bigger or 20 times bigger than it is today, and I know that it had that chance and I can't deliver that, I may still end up unhappy. If on the other hand, it only has the option to, to be what it is today and I delivered that for, what, for whatever reason, it doesn't have the potential to become any more, I'll probably be pretty happy with it. So, so the outcome will be dependent on what it could have been, I think. Yeah? If somebody comes tomorrow and say, you know, we're sorry, but we want to regulate this, you're not allowed to do it anymore, we're going to close down the bank, sorry about that, Lars Christensen, you know, you'll have to say, well, okay, I mean, that was a little bit out of my control, so, so we'll have to move on to the next thing, right? So I, I think it's difficult to say. But I think there's growth potential in this business. I think it has the right business model. I think it's the way that the world is moving. So if we couldn't take it quite a bit further from here, I would, I would be disappointed. I don't know if that was the question or... Uh, so. Actually, sometimes people said, uh, because when you, when you have like strategy days and you tell people, well, this year we make like this and next year you have to do like this and next year you have to do like this, and people say, you know, why can't you never be happy with what you have? You know, why do we always have to do 40% more next year? Uh, well, the answer is very simple because if you don't do it, uh, somebody else is going to do it, and, and in relative terms, you are doing worse, right? In, in, in valuation for a business, we all know here, if we go to business school or have some kind of business experience, the difference between a company that made $100 million but has done that for the past four years and, uh, and a business that made two, 20, 50, 100 million and looks to perhaps do 200 next year, that company, second company is worth 10 times what the first company is worth, right? It's because that is what, what is uh, the basic idea of business is to grow, right? Uh, other types of organizations may have other ambitions, but, but a, a commercial organization must have as one, at least one very important part of its goals must be to continue to develop and, and grow it, right? Uh, so, so if you have that chance and don't do it, you can actually end up, I think, quite disappointed, even if in absolute terms you're doing okay. But uh, again, I hope I don't have to face the question too, uh, too soon. We have time for two more questions, maybe three. Good afternoon. My name is Petr Hornicki and I'm working for a Finnish trade center. Um, I would like to ask you how perspective is for Saxobank the uh, Czech market and if you could do a short comparison between Czech Republic, Poland and then Slovakian market. I think you are, you are pushing me here on, on, on my expertise. I actually have the head of the, the, the Czech office here in the, in the, in the in the crowd, so maybe you can ask him afterwards. But but uh, but seen from my point of view, um, I think it's it's pretty evident from my presentation that I have certain concerns about the development of Western Europe. Right? Uh, I, I I'm just very concerned that we are on a wrong track in in Western Europe. I have some hope for Central Europe, Eastern Europe, that that actually that may be the saving grace in the long run for, for Europe because I just don't think salvation will come from France or from Italy or from Spain, right? It may come from, from more vibrant economies that, that have not been lumbered for so many years with, with huge uh, overhanging complicated structural problems, right? So I think one of the reasons that we're here in Prague is that we consider Prague kind of the, the best of all worlds. It's uh, it still has a, a business-friendly environment. It still has growth potential. It's come, obviously, in, in 20 years a very long way uh, towards uh, wealth levels that are comparable to, to Western Europe uh, from a much uh, weaker point of departure. At the same, so it has growth, uh, but it also has a business-friendliness and, and a, a somewhat smaller uh, public sector overhang on, on the economy. So, so that fits into our idea of, of the 
uh, maybe the frontier market is a bit too, too wrong, uh, but growth markets where there's a prospect of, of bigger growth than I would expect in, in, uh, in Western Europe, right? Uh, and I think, uh, I think the Czech Republic fits into that category. One of the reasons that, uh, that we went specifically here was that we've always uh, found a pretty good responsiveness from investors here. They seem to, to be more sophisticated here than in many uh, of the other uh, newer uh, countries. Uh, so, uh, so it was a natural place for us to go and actually I think over time we will, we will put more effort in here and, and, and potentially run other of the countries in the regions from, from this office here rather than out of Copenhagen. Uh, I, think, uh, I think basically that, that uh, there's a, it can change obviously because politics change but I think at this current time in Poland in the Czech Republic, uh, in, in Slovakia, there's, a, there's a, a somewhat more benign environment for business, lower taxation, uh, perhaps more hunger also among people, not so many expectations that the government owes you everything. Uh, so, so I just think there's more growth opportunities here and I think that's pretty much uh, uh, a, a, a factor that plays in in, in, in most of, of the new countries that, that came from, from 1989 and onwards. Yeah? Uh, into the sort of European uh, trading zone. So we, we have had a good experience here. Uh, I think actually we have done better than, than we expected, I think is, is fair to say, and, and we have high expectations, so, so we have done very well. Um, we have good business in Poland, uh, and, and uh, thinking about also having, being on the ground there. So I think uh, for us it's, it's a very interesting area. I think the whole, what we call Eastern European in sort of our view of things, which includes Central Europe, uh, the Eastern European countries and Russia, is today one of the three, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's number two or number three of the nine regions that we kind of see the world in. We split it up in you know, Asia Pacific, Americas, uh, Middle East, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe. And uh, uh, today, clearly, Western Europe is the biggest contributor in terms of revenues, but, but, uh, but is it second biggest? Uh, is, is Eastern Europe third biggest? I'm corrected here. But, but that group of countries is actually the third biggest revenue driver for Saxo Bank. So, so clearly something, and it's quite close between number one, two, and three. So, uh, so it's, it's quite important for us. Uh, regarding critics of government, uh, uh, the European Union have implemented a cross-border cooperation program called FAR CBC. Uh, as to the three countries' corner of the Czech Republic, Poland, and Germany, uh, the steps or the plans of this program were to were to implement projects of uh, environmental cooperation, then inf inf infrastructural uh, cooperation among the three states concerned, and finally, the cooperation of the enterprises in the region. Uh, I have submitted a research on the decrease of cross-border cooperation in the region mentioned, and the third step concerning the enterprises' cooperation did not come true, finally. Uh, and now I'm coming back to the point. Would you wish, I've brought a built-in. Do you wish me to gift you a short bill turn after the end of this discussion. A short what, sorry? My pardon? Uh, will, should, should you give me a what, a short what? Bill turn, a paper. Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. I, I appreciate that if you have shown something that actually uh, proves some of the points. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And a very last question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Hinged and I would like to really thank you because for me it was a pleasure to meet someone who uh, has uh, in fact the same ideas like I held <laughs> and I've never never um, imagined that I would see someone uh, on a high level in corporate business like you who is giving his em employees the copies of Atlas Shrugged <laughs> like you do. <laughs> So that's really uh, something um, I would like to comment and just from my, my, my perspective it's very, very nice to see someone like you. Um, and secondly, I would like to comment on the thing which you mentioned that the defense of capitalism is really not on the, let's say, 
political ground, but more on the moral ground. What I would say also is more like um, that on, on, on my view, what, what current population needs or what, uh, what our current, current people and current, current teachers of, for example, economics uh, need is more inductive thinking that many people have forgotten to look at reality. Many people are rationalizing. And for example, I, I remember um, hearing in some TV discussion to politicians, to politicians arguing about something and suddenly someone said, but this is how it is done in the EU. And suddenly the whole discussion stopped, like the EU has the right right for, for the truth. But of course, that's, 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 that's not correct. So my comment is more, more, more inductive thinking on, on, uh, to defend capitalism as well. And I have, I have one, one question. Um, as you are a person in business, how do you see uh, current businessmen if, if they are more like into, um, into the political thing, which means seeking, seeking some governmental aid, etc., or if in the future there will be more, more businessmen like, like, for example, you are. Thank you. Well, thank you for the kind words at the beginning uh, with regards to, to, to uh, uh, the moral ground and the politicization of science, which I think is extremely disturbing. I mean, it, it's, it's very visible in, in the environmental and climate uh, debate. Whatever you think about this, I mean, you can have many views. Uh, but but uh, but clearly it's highly politicized and, and science is not really even trying to be an absolute anymore, which is very problematic. And I think that's spreading fast, unfortunately, to, to a number of other scientific areas. And, and, and this is really a corruption of hundreds of years of, of disciplined thinking that, that, that is under threat here, that, that all of a sudden science also has to be politically correct. That, that's very, very worrying because that, that ultimately is going to undermine the whole fundament of, 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 of even of the, of the financial basis if we can't trust science and, and, and research and stuff like that as, as at least attempts at being objective. So I, I share very much that concern. Uh, um, and with regard to the last question, I think it's complicated, right? Because we are in a position now where we can all dream that the world was different and there had been freedom and I think the whole world would have been immensely much wealthier and we would have much less social problems if we had taken a different course 50 years ago, but we haven't. We, have, we are where we are, which of course means that uh, there's a lot of compromises that needs to be, be made by everyone, right? Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally you have to, you have to of course, accept the rule of law and, and even when a lot of law is coming in that's completely irrational you can't really say well now I'm going to pick I want to follow that law but I don't want to follow that law I don't think that's an option I think you have to go a different way to try to affect the lawmakers to to ultimately make better laws but uh, or alternatively leave for somewhere where there are more sensible laws right so given that so much is being regulated and law based and you have to in any uh, functioning society, you have to accept the rule of law without questioning it. Uh, I think uh, that forces a lot of compromises. It forces you to do a lot of completely rational things uh, that you don't want to do, but because, I mean, some, some anarchist would say, well, a really bad law, just break it and, 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 and get on with life, right? And, and of course, that means that from a, from a puristic point of view, even I or other business people have to very often compromise with what they think is rational and sensible and right because it's the law. And I, I still have to say that if, if you cannot, uh, you have to accept the law, otherwise you have to find another country, right? Uh, and, and that forces you into lots and lots of compromises. And of course, once you have an a, a unsound system, uh, if you just pull away support from it overnight, it may cause more damage to it than, than if you dismantle it in a more rational way. Good examples could be what we see in the banking sector. I adhere to, I think, a lot of the problems are created by overly protective schemes. That means that you even don't have to think about, uh, if you have Bank A here saying it's a useless bank, it's run really terrible, it needs some money very badly, but I'll give you 10% interest. And you have a well-run bank here that doesn't really have the bad need for your money, and they will give you 1% interest. If the government guarantees both deposits, where are you going to put your money? The average guy is going to put it with a 10%, meaning that he, 
he further helps along a, a unsound business at the at the cost of, 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 of taking business away from the sound business. So does that mean you should immediately remove all deposit guarantees? Probably not, because certainly unless you were sure everybody did it, the first country that did that would not have a great deal of deposits, right? Uh, so, so there are many things in there which means that a, changing something that's unsound cannot be done overnight, no matter how idealistic you are. At least it would have very, very dramatic and potentially unintended consequences, right? So you have to, just as it took many, many years to get us into this mess, it's going to take us, even if we decided we want to get out of it, which is far from the case, but even if we decided, everyone, now we're going to work together to build a sounder foundation, it would still take many years to, to push back those borders. And, and in a society where 50% of the of, of, of economy is in control uh, by, by the government, it's very, very hard not to have to collaborate with it in some way, shape, or form uh, uh, for, for almost all business people. So I think it's, it's, it's difficult to be too, sit on too wide and high a horse on that subject. I think businesses that are fundamentally unsound, that wouldn't exist if there wasn't a government that supported them for political reasons. And I can think of a few green companies that really has no justification whatsoever that those guys live purely from lobbyism and purely because it gets the politicians votes and, and they get rich on that basis. I find that, that highly immoral and I think that's where a businessman should look himself in the mirror and say, you know, I have to find another business because this, I, I, I can't live with getting rich that way. But so there's like extremes where it's just completely indefensible and you would never ever dream of doing it yourself as a businessman. And there are national, uh, the, the, the natural compromises that have to be taken because we are in such a, a big unholy mess already that, that uh, if you just were completely anarchistic and completely uh, extreme in your views, you, the whole thing would just fall apart, which I think uh, is also not very desirable. So it is a process of small steps, but the most important thing is that that process starts so we don't make it worse and worse. I think a very good example is, uh, for example, the Greece question. Right now we spend a lot of resources trying to maintain Greece in an in untenable, hopeless situation for Greece that's damaging to Greece and damaging to the remains of the Eurozone. Why not spend all those resources on trying to get them out? and get them on a solid footing so in a few years time at least we could say hey we'll come down and we'll have our holidays and you'll be happy again and, and you're not part of this mess we still spend a lot of money on it but at least we achieved something right and I think that's a very good example of there's a process either way but right now we're just completely wasting huge resources on on something unsustainable where we at least we if we have to use those resources let's use them on creating something sustainable right so uh, but it's uh, uh, you can't think about that type of moralism all the time because then it would be impossible to do business in a modern world, right? So you have to sometimes compromise and, and fundamentally, as I said, you have, to, you have to respect the rule of law because otherwise there's nothing, right? Even if some of the laws are very bad. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is the very end of uh, Tevro Institute Business Forum. Um, um, I guess it, you all would agree with me that it was a unique chance to discuss issues about both banking business and freedom and the essence of freedom. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and this is, as I said, a series of lecture. The next one in uh, March, uh, toward the end of March, March 23rd, uh, we expect another interesting guest to show up at our school. It will be Professor Peter Betke of George Mason University. Uh, he will have here a public talk part of uh, Tevro Institute Academic Forum. And that will be a special event also because we are going to, to launch a new book called Robust Political Economy for the 21st Century, a collection of best papers by Professor Betke. Uh, you are very much welcome, and please uh, follow our website or sign up for our mailing uh, invitations. Uh, as you already know, this is a school, but apart from being a school, we want to have a lot of interesting events, public talks, uh, social events, so that there is really vibrant life and people talk about issues 
connected to the big, uh, let's say, battles between ideas, freedom on one side and omnipotent government on the other. So uh, please keep coming and I wish you a very nice evening today. Thank you.